Oh. Hello there. My name is Nicholas Williamson, and today we're going to be talking about Edith Wharton and her life and her legacy and one of her most well-known words, Roman fever. So come with me. In Edith Wharton's early years of life, Wharton was born Edith Newbold Jones into a wealthy New York family in 1862. Her parents were George Frederick and Lucretia Rhinelander Jones. Edith spent much of her childhood in Europe, mainly France, Germany, Italy, developing both her gift for languages and a deep appreciation for beauty in art, architecture, and literature. In Edith Wharton's young adulthood, during this period in Edith Wharton's life, she begins to study French and German as well as other subjects. She also writes a novel titled Fast and Loose of 30,000 words, which she finishes in January of 1877. She also has a collection of poems that is privately printed by her mother named Verses. In 1880, five of Edith's poems appeared in Atlantic Monthly and two appeared in New York World. During the same time, her father passed away. Later on in Edith Wharton's adult life and her marriage, in 1885, she married Edward Robbins Teddy Wharton. Though imperfectly suited for each other, the couple filled their early married years with travel, houses, and dogs. Edith continues her vigorous readings and intensive studies of art, science, philosophy, and literature. She is also introduced to evolutionary theories during this time. Edith Wharton's True Beginnings as a Writer Over the next decade or more, Edith Wharton continued to write, amongst other things. Her and her husband also continued to travel around the world and up and down the east coast of the United States. In 1901, the couple purchased 113 acres near Lee, Massachusetts. They would go on to build a house that they named the Mount. Edith Wharton designed the home in a way that it would meet her need as a designer, a gardener, a hostess, and above all, a writer. The effects of World War I. In 1914, when World War I broke out, Edith Wharton was a wealthy, famous, recently divorced, and living in her favorite city, Paris. Instead of fleeing for England or the United States, Wharton established workroom for unemployed, helped tuberculosis sufferers, made hostels for refugees, and schools for children fleeing war-torn Belgium. She was one of a handful of writers that were allowed on the front line. In 1916, Wharton received the French Legion of Honor for her war work. Edith Wharton's Legacy For the rest of her life, she divided her time between her two homes, her friends and dogs, her writing, her traveling, and her gardening. She only returned to the United States twice after her move to France, the final time in 1923 to receive her honorary doctorate from Yale. 
She died on August 11th, 1937. At the age of 75, she was buried close to her good friend, Walter Berry. And now, a short film by N.W. Pathling, Roman Feet. Grace. Alita. How are you, darling? I'm well in yourself. Oh, I'm doing okay. Alita, what are the chances that you and I are both in Italy at the exact same moment? <laughs> I was so excited to receive your note at the hotel. I was just excited that you even wanted to read it. How could you have possibly known that I'd be there? I wouldn't have known unless our darling daughters hadn't been playing bridge the other night. Oh, yes, that's right. Oh, what a delight. There's supposed to be a full moon tonight. How smashing. Do you know when the girls will be back from their aviation trip? I haven't the slightest clue. But Barbara did mention something about coming back by moonlight. <laughs> moonlight? Moonlight? You think they're just as sentimental as we once were? I've come to conclude that I haven't the slightest idea of what they are. Perhaps. Maybe even us, Alita. Maybe we didn't know more about each other. Perhaps not. I never should have assumed you were sentimental. Perhaps I wasn't. Five o'clock already? Would you like to play a hand or two at the embassy tonight? You know, now to think about it, perhaps not. Oh, I don't care at all. It's lovely here. So full of old memories. You know, I was thinking. I always used to think that our mothers had much more difficult job than our grandmothers. When Roman fever stalked the streets, it must have been comparatively easy to gather the girls in that danger hour. When you and I were young, with such beauty, it was calling us. And with the spice of disobedience run in, it was no more risk than catching a cold during the cool hour afternoon sunset. The mothers used to be put to it. They kept us in, didn't they? Yes, they must have. <laughs> yes? I was only thinking about your Babs. Uh, Babs carries everything before her. That Camparelli boy, he's such a fine match. He's one of the finest matches in Rome. Oh, don't look so innocent, my dear. I was wondering, respectfully, how you and Harvey Sansley could come up with such a dynamic product such as Babs. Think you overrate Babs, my dear. No. I always wanted a brilliant daughter. And I never understood why I had such a perfect angel instead. Babs is an angel too, you know. Of course, of course. But she's got them wandering rings. The rainbow wings is what they call it. They're wandering by the sea with their young men. And here we sit. Brings back the past a little bit more. Cutely, you say? You've always known you've had such a delicate throat, hadn't you? Oh, we're all right up here. Down below in the forum, it does get deathly cold all of a sudden, but not here. There's no Roman fever. The forum is deathly cold after sunset, especially after a hot day. 
in the Colosseum? Well, that's even more colder and damper. The Colosseum. Why, yes, the Colosseum. It wasn't easy getting in. After the gates were locked at night. Far from easy, but still could be managed. It could be managed often because lovers would go there to meet after sunset. You knew that. I dare say. I don't remember. <laughs> you don't remember. You don't remember to going to visit some type of architectural ruin. That one evening, that night, when we were girls, you were going to watch the moon rise. People always said that was the expedition of your illness. Did they? Oh, Alita. It was so long ago. Yes, and you got well again. It didn't matter. But I suppose, I suppose it struck your friends a little reasoning for giving some kind of illness. I mean, because everybody knew that you were so prudent on account of your throat and your mother took such good care of you. You had been late outside sea, hadn't you, that night? Perhaps I had. Most prudent girls aren't always prudent. What made you think of it now? Because I can't bear it any longer. Can't bear what? Why, of your not knowing, I've always known why you went. Why I went? You think I'm bluffing. Well, I know that you went that night. To meet the man I was engaged to. I can report to every word that was said. No. No. Please don't. Oh, listen. I can repeat every word. Oh, darling. Please. Things can't go on like this. Come meet me at the Coliseum tomorrow night at once. Someone will be there to let you in. Don't think that anyone there will be suspect of you. Or have you forgotten about that letter? I remember it by heart, too. Was that everything that was in the letter that took you there that evening? I don't know how you knew. I burned that letter at once. And if you burn the letter, you're wondering how on earth I know what was in it. Look at this. I knew what was in the letter because I wrote it. You wrote it? Do you understand? That I found out. And I hated you. I hated you. I was afraid of you and your quiet ways. You've always been so prudent. Well, I wanted you out of the way. And I thought that the only way to get you out of the way was to write the letter. So you could go to the Coliseum that night. Cold, dark, dampened. I knew that you had a delicate throat. I knew that you'd get sick. <sighs> I don't know why I'm telling you this now. I suppose it's because you've always gone on hating me. Perhaps. Perhaps, yes. Or it's because I want to get the whole thing off of my mind. I am glad, however, that you destroyed the letter. I never thought you'd die. I don't know. It was the only letter I had, and you say he didn't write it. Oh, God! It's nauseating how you care for him still. Now he's dead. And he's still mine. I cared for the memory. And I wish now I never told you. I had no idea you feel about it as you do. I thought you'd be amused. It all happened so long ago. As you say, you must do me justice. 
to remember that I had no reason to think that you ever taken it seriously. Now, how could I? When you were married to Horace Ansley. Two months afterward, as soon as you could get out of bed, your mother rushed you off to Florence and ha happily married you. People rather surprised they wondered, as it was done so quickly. But I thought I knew. I had an idea about it. And your Marion so soon convinced me that you never really even cared. Yes. I suppose it would. Well, girls are ferocious. But I didn't wait. He arranged everything. He was there. We were let in. Delphin. There. They just let you in? You're lying! He was there. Naturally, he came. Came? How did he know that he should find you there? Are you stark mad? But I answered the letter. I told him I would be waiting. So he came. It is cold here. We'd better go. I'm sorry for you. Yes, we better go. But I don't know why you should feel sorry for- Well, because I didn't have to wait that night. I was beat there. But I ought not to begrudge you. At the end of all those years, I had Delphin. I had him. And you had nothing. You had nothing. The only thing that you had was a letter he didn't write. I also had Barbara. All she had was a letter he didn't write.